So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this session uh, about uh, whether the new energy and climate policy represents setting standards or not. Uh, it's a very exciting time for many reasons. Um, my name is Matteo Maggiore. I'm the head of communication of the European Investment Bank, the EU Bank. I'm joined here on the podium by uh, the president of the EU Bank, uh, Werner Hoyer, uh, Chris Hurst, director general of uh, projects, and Martin Berg, a colleague also active in climate. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, uh, fantastically exciting and difficult and challenging uh, time in, in uh, our life. We, uh, the, the motto of this conference is time to act. Uh, the EIB started acting in this area uh, a very long time ago, uh, but now it is time also to redraw our, our uh, uh, roadmap. And that is what we have been doing in the past months. And uh, uh, we have designed an ambition that is uh, 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 very high indeed, uh, just giving a, a stronger contribution to taking our effort, a joint effort to fight uh, global warming uh, uh, from billions to trillions, making sure that 50% uh, 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 of what we do, plus everything else we do, contributes to the uh, uh, objectives of uh, the Paris 2015 uh, agreement and ensuring also that uh, uh, as we do that, no one is left behind and perhaps we shift away from, from seeing the world in terms of trade-offs and uh, uh, as if there were uh, uh, a need to compensate between saving the future and, and uh, making sure nobody leaves, gets left behind today. Um, uh, President Hoyer will, uh, uh, will make a short address and then we'll go directly into Q&As. So without further ado, President. Grazie, Matteo. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I must begin by saying it's a pleasure to be in Madrid and to thank our Chilean and Spanish hosts for setting up this conference. It's amazing what has been achieved within a very few weeks that our Spanish friends had time to organize this event. So congratulations, España. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the slogan here at COP25 is time for action, tiempo de actuar. Uh, we at EIB are determined to make sure that this will not remain a slogan. That is why today I'm proud to present to you the new climate action roadmap and energy lending policy of the EU Bank. We are at a pivotal moment and citizens expect us to act the planet requires it. And we have seen this uh, paradigm change with our audiences over the last six months. During the European election campaign, it was obvious that public attitudes to this issue have fundamentally changed. Our EIB climate survey finds that 82% of Europeans report that climate action has an impact on their everyday lives a perception that goes up to 98% in China and 76% in the United States. It is clear, and I put it in this phrase a couple of months ago at the IMF meeting in Bali, we are on the right track since Paris COP21, but we are far behind schedule, so it's time to wake up. We need to speed up our response, to act urgently and with more ambition. If we I believe if we do not act, we will risk losing the trust of people and failing future generations. Concretely for us at the U-Bank, this means mobilizing private investment to finance climate action projects. This is key for everything that has to do with COP21, Paris objectives, just as well as with the Sustainable Development Goals the United Nations decided in the same year, four years ago. You can forget about COP21, and you can forget about the Sustainable Development Goals if you try to finance all this with taxpayers' money only. We need to mobilize the private sector for it. And that's what a crowding in-bank like EIB is for. Our endowment with cash is very, very limited. We are refinancing ourselves totally on the capital markets, which requires the trust of the investors, 
which buy our bonds between 70 and 90 billion euros per year, and they believe that what we do is economically viable and sustainable. These are the key ingredients of the, of the legal base of the work of the EU Bank since 62 years. So sustainability is at the basis of the concept of the European Investment Bank. The new European Commission under President Ursula von der Leyen understands this well. As she said on the opening day of this conference in Madrid, we need investment in research, innovation, and green technologies to cut emissions while also creating jobs and improving our quality of life. In pursuing the European Green Deal, she has asked the EU Bank to become the financial engine of European leadership on climate action. And there, I insist, we need together, keep together the climate objectives and our challenges on innovation, research, and technology. Because climate action, in our eyes, is not a way to make the lives of people miserable, but to find intelligent ways how to combat climate change with modern means. The EU Bank has been Europe's climate bank for a long time. Obviously, we have been detected and put center stage now for, the couple of, for a couple of months, but we have been in climate business for the entire history of the, of the bank. In Paris, we committed to do 25% of our lending related to climate. And when we say climate, then we mean climate, and not a little bit of climate, but real climate projects. So there we are credible. Also, when we issued, issued the first green bonds 12 years ago at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, people considered that at that time a pretty lunatic experience. But now that the market has grown to $850 billion, people don't find it lunatic at all anymore. It is very, very serious and extremely successful. In addition to our activities inside the European Union, we support EU policy objectives and contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals through investment in some 160 countries. This includes solar energy in Gambia and India, sustainable transport projects from Ecuador to Bangladesh, and climate resilience and adaptation projects in the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands. Now, the EU Bank has decided to greatly strengthen its ambition. As the largest multilateral development bank in the world, the EU Bank will stop financing energy projects reliant on, fossil, on unabated fossil fuels by the end of 2021. We will launch the most ambitious in climate investment roadmap of any international financial institution anywhere. So you hear there is no lack of ambition. The IB Group will use its financing to support more than $1.1 trillion for investments in climate action and environmental sustainability over the next decade, while increasing the share of climate and environmental sustainability investment in EIB's financing portfolio to 50% by 2025. In addition, the EIB Group, which comprises the European Investment Fund, our subsidiary, the leading investor in European small and medium-sized businesses, and the EIB, the European Investment Bank, the entire group will align its financing activities with the principles of goals of the Paris Agreement by the end of 2020. This is very important because it doesn't make sense to say that you raise the level of climate projects to 50% of your lending, and with the other 50%, you destroy what you have set up before. So the rest must not undermine the successes for the first 50% of our lending. The EIB's ambitious new energy lending policy is a crucial milestone in our fight against climate change and in the support of the EU's global climate goals. It follows the largest ever public consultation on EIB lending and sets a new standard for international financial institutions. The new policy will prioritize investments in clean energy innovation, energy efficiency and renewables, both within the European Union and around the world. As a matter of fact, climate projects are outside the European Union, an even higher percentage than inside the European Union. Uh, look in particular at, at Latin America and the Caribbean, where 70% of our lending last year was related to climate projects. 70, 70. In addition, our shareholders, the 28 member states, of the European Union, which sit on the board of directors of the bank, 
decided with a very large majority to phase out the financing of unabated fossil fuel energy projects, including natural gas, by the end of 2021. But, as we have seen in recent years, climate policies can be perfectly designed, but if they leave communities behind, they will invite a backlash and likely fail. There is a clear need to help regions and communities that will be adversely affected by a structural shift away from carbon-intensive activities. That's why we have announced a dedicated energy transition package. This offers support for lower-income member states in the European Union to help support the national transition of the energy system. The EIB will be able to finance up to 75 percent of the eligible project cost for new energy investment. This is unusual. We ne never go to 75 percent. Normally, we go for one-third or maximum 50 percent. In these rare cases, we are going to go up to 75 percent. But that, the just transition is not uh, just about uh, clean energy. It is also about replacing employment in polluting industries with new jobs in clean and green industries. And this is a very tough transition. This is why the EU Bank is working closely with the European Commission on the Just Transition Initiative in order to unlock finance and expertise in the areas covered by this initiative. <coughs> in the course of next year, on the basis also of what the European Commission is going to announce this very week, the EIB will present a dedicated Just Transition proposal to its Board of Directors. For us, our climate goals and our objectives to improve development, economic, and social cohesion go hand in hand. There is no trade-off between different priorities. We admit to climate in everything we do. In the past, we were sometimes in the situation that our, own, our owners, board of directors or our governors asked us, do you want to do more climate and energy efficiency or more an innovation? No, we want more climate action via innovation. So we have to bring our objectives together and overcome these dichotomies. Ladies and gentlemen, the EIB may be the largest fund multilateral financing institution in the world, but we know that alone we cannot achieve what is needed. As we embark on this ambitious energy and climate investment roadmap, we will work closely with our partners, the national governments which own us, the European Commission, fellow multilateral and national public financial institutions here in Spain, in particular with ECO, civil society, and crucially, the private sector, to meet one of the greatest challenges of our generation. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Very good. You start here in the first row. Thank you. Kjetil Alstheim from Norwegian Business Daily, Dagens Næringsliv. Uh, what do you expect the new lending policy will mean for a natural gas exporting country like Norway? Well, it's, gas will not disappear. Gas will be uh, an energy at least for a longer tr uh, transition. So uh, if I were a wealthy Norwegian, I would still be a very happy man. But uh, the role of gas in the overall energy supply is going to go down over the next years and decades. The question for us is, do we invest in new infrastructure in the context of fossil fuels? And there, my answer is not only politically motivated and based on, let's say, environmental convictions and on wishful thinking, maybe. No, it's based on, on economic facts. I have to, as somebody who needs to get the trust of the investors in order to finance what we are doing, we need to convince our investors that we are doing reasonable things and they invest in something that bring, will bring an economic return. If, however, we know that we, if by investing into a, an infrastructure like network infrastructure, which is scheduled to, to last a lifespan of 45, 50 years, and we know that 15 years from now, we will have to bail out because we will have to write off these assets, then we make economically a huge mistake. You don't invest into something where you know you have a write-off need after 10 or 15 years. So this is why from a purely bank banking point of view, 
and this is also the reaction of the private sector in banking, don't do something that doesn't make sense economically. That does not mean that gas will disappear. Good. So, question there, and then here. Um, hi, Kalina Roshakov, Political Europe. I was wondering, um, how has the reception been here to your lending policy, especially from um, African countries? And um, I was speaking to uh, the EBRD recently, and they kind of suggested that perhaps your lending policy might exclude some activities for the EIB in Africa. So I was interested in hearing your comments on that. Thanks. Oh, um, I have a certain smile on my face when I hear that argument. Uh, so there might be people who have an interest to move into sub-Saharan Africa or something like this, so I don't take that too seriously. Uh, no, we have to keep things in perspective. We, in, in Africa, uh, our main and very, very trusted partner is the African Development Bank and, of course, the World Bank colleagues. And this cooperation is not at all uh, burdened by, by this decision that we have taken. What we have said, however, quite clearly is that uh, criteria which we bring to use when it comes to projects in Europe will not be lessened or, or reduced when we finance elsewhere. So when we come to criteria like uh, emissions, and this is the key thing, emission uh, and, and carbon contribution, then this is the same thing whether it's in Africa or here. I think we we need to even beef up our activities in Africa considerably. And we have seen over the last years that Africa uh, is, is moving center stage. But for Africa and for development, and development globally, by the way, the sentence remains true. Let us not allow ourselves to run into competition of objectives. We will make the transition in Africa only with a frog leap development that moves technology and innovation and not by investing into old technologies. So I'm, I'm not at all worried about this. Uh, on the other hand, um, our activities outside the European Union will gain huge importance for, for many reasons and I hope our, our owners, our governors will, will see that sooner or later because the EU bank will be challenged around the world in order to contribute to the objectives of the European Union. In Africa, it's quite obvious in view of the enormous demographic trends there. So we have to organize and help our African friends to arrive at a frog leap development that is based on, on latest technologies. Uh, and therefore, we must, uh, we must reinvent development policies, to put it that way. In Latin America, the situation is a little bit different. But Latin America is, of course, our uh, longest standing <clears throat> partner in, in this world. And when it comes to strategic alliances, nobody is closer to Europe than Latin America and should therefore not be neglected. And strategically, our interests in, in, into Asia uh, are very obvious. If you look at the tectonic changes that take place in this world, in particular between the United States and China and other players in Africa, India, about which nobody talks, strangely enough. So we have to be a global globally oriented institution, but uh, that does not mean that we should uh, all of a sudden be um, non-environment uh, conscious when we move outside the sphere of the European Union. Uh, emissions are global by definition, and therefore uh, the objectives of carbon neutrality is something that applies for us globally. Very good. Another question here. Hi, uh, this is Bronwyn Tucker with Oil Change International. Um, I, our organization was active in a fossil-free EIB coalition um, over the past years, and so I wanted to thank you for the, the leadership that you've taken with the, the new energy lending policy. Um, and I was also excited to hear you say that you're wanting to look uh, to work with other multilateral development banks um, towards Paris alignment. Um, so I wanted to ask just specifically um, how you expect to leverage this leadership um, towards greater commitments across the nine MDBs, um, and specifically um, for your event tomorrow, if you're expecting to be able to uh, make an announcement in that direction. Our cooperation with the other big MDBs, multilateral development banks, 
but of course also our national partners, which are sometimes huge. I mean, the uh, big five uh, national promotional banks in, in, in the European Union, the big, f five biggest ones, are together more than twice the volume of, of the EIB. So we are aware that we have very valuable partners also there. And um, uh, that is certainly true for, for, for the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the Asian and all the others. So cooperation is, is, is very, very close. And of course, a dialogue takes place there as well. And we have seen how difficult it was to lead this consultation process and also the internal deliberations. All the contradictions uh, among the member states of the European Union are, of course, reflected in the organs of the EIB. We reflect practically the setup of the European Union. But at the end of the day, we were able to find an agreement with 94% of the represented capital in the bank. And I can imagine that in other multilateral institutions, this process is just as difficult and will hopefully come to similar results. We can only encourage our partners because uh, we believe that uh, we can also uh, ensure the relevance of our institutions for the next decades by making this new courageous step. Okay, I haven't seen any more hands, so if that is the case, uh, we're bang on time to wrap up this session. Thank you very, very much for attending. Thank you so much. Take care.